Hello, History 72A, Winter Quarter 2024. We are in that place now where lectures are going to take off a little bit faster than the weekly quizzes. I sent you a Canvas message, so hopefully you're warned and you don't panic if some of the lectures are up there. Use the quizzes, quizzes as a judge of when you need to watch a certain lecture. Quiz number five, speaking of quizzes, ask you to define one of the terms on the slide here from last lecture without using any of the words that are in the phrase to define the phrase. Keep these concepts in mind as we go through this lecture. Gender roles, gender systems, borderlands history, gender frontier. And the challenge is to try to define these terms without using either of the words in the term. For example, if you were to write a definition for gender roles, you could not use either the word gender or the word role or roles in your definition. We left off last time with the idea of meetings between specific different groups of people, all with their own set of social constructions and all with their unique histories. From the time at which they first met, these groups would be part of the historical context for one another, and the actions, motivations, and interactions of all shaped new historical contexts going forward in time. Each meeting, each contact zone or borderland was unique, but they fit into larger patterns. Historical context is approached in layers. For example, at the macro level, we could talk about Europe and North America over the period from Columbus to the Enlightenment. At the macro level, we tend to see patterns and causes of large changes. For example, the diversity and interactions of language groups and societies in North America before European arrival. In Europe, the formation of nation states and the drive for exploration and colonization as a source of power. And between the two continents, what's called the Columbian Exchange, which is the movement of plants, animals, and disease vectors across the Atlantic Ocean in both directions. Cows introduced to North America, horses introduced to North America, potatoes, chilies, maize, that type of corn as opposed to corn used as a general term for grain, tomatoes, all of those introduced from the so-called New World from the perspective of the Europeans to Europe itself. From that macro level, we can look closer and closer through borderlands and gender frontiers until we get to the level of individual relationships to micro history. Each level of approach gives us different information, but all levels are important to understanding the past and all levels are, reasonably enough, interrelated. Understanding the big picture helps us identify the trends we will be seeing or not seeing at greater levels of detail. Detail shows events on the ground that influenced larger patterns, why small groups and individuals did what they did as they tried to navigate their individual lives within the big pictures. Over the next few lectures, we will be looking closer at different regions, but for the most part, not all the way down to fine details. We'll be somewhere in the middle. In this lecture, we will look at the pueblos before the Spanish arrived, and then look at the Spanish invaders before contact with the pueblos. The Spanish are broken into two categories here, because these two groups, soldiers and missionary Franciscan monks, we're in conflict with one another, and increasingly so when we get to part three, contact. The Pueblos were not some sort of static, unchanging society before the arrival of the Spanish. I'm going to start close to the point of contact because that is where historians have the most information. This on the slide currently is big picture, clearly not details. On the left is the general distribution of Native American societies as Europeans arrived with their minds on exploration, wealth, power, and land. 
On the right is more or less the way that Europeans viewed North America before we get to the 18th century, the 1700s. This lecture and one of your available readings focus on meetings in the southwest region of what we now call the United States. The reading that you have from Juliana Barr, Peace Came in the Form of a Woman, focuses on this region here, here. The subtitle of the book tells you that you will be reading about borderlands. The map on the left suggests that you will be reading about the Cado, Nachitoches, or both. It's the Cado mainly in the chapter that you have. The map on the right indicates that you will be reading about the Spanish in yellow, the French in green, or both. If you have looked at that particular reading, you know that it deals with both French and Spanish. This was an incredibly complicated region with many different meetings and interactions. You do not need to do the bar reading to do well in the class, but I suggest at least doing the first level of gutting with it to appreciate the differences between the stories there and the ones that I am going to describe in this lecture. Lecture today will be about the Pueblos here in gray. There are other groups listed on the gray as well, but the Pueblos are right here. If you look at that space on the map at the right, it's in the yellow region, speckled with red. This is an area the Spaniards claimed, but they never held continuously or completely. Reconstruction of Pueblo life before or at the time of Spanish conquest is subject to some major limitations. There is a strong archaeological record for the Pueblo, but physical remains have no meaning in their own right and are interpreted by archaeologists and other scholars who are embedded in their own historical context. There are records kept by the Spanish created at the time of meeting, but Spanish records are subject to the misinterpretations and seeing of an entirely different external group with no shared history and a group bent on conquest at that. The Acoma Pueblo appears to have been continuously occupied since around 1300, but even without European and later American interference, Pueblo society and worldview would morph in some ways over time, like any other cultures. Acoma oral traditions are rich, and their creation myth extremely well recorded, but see all of the caveats in red above. To write this lecture, I have used work by an historian who acknowledges and tries to work with an awareness of all of these limitations. Nevertheless, like any modern reconstruction of a far distant past, the model I present here is completely open to reinterpretation and rejection by other scholars, as well as the Pueblo people themselves. Although the Pueblo people built solid towns, they appear to have adopted a nomadic lifestyle when needed for water or food. So settlement was not completely static. Groups would unite and scatter depending on the resources that were available in any year. In 1525, bands of nomadic Athapascans moved into the Pueblo region, competing for hunted and gathered resources. The Pueblos and the Athapascans had worked out a system of combining trading with raiding of one another when the Spanish arrived on the scene in 1539. At the time of Spanish arrival, scholars estimate that there may have been 248,000 Pueblo people living throughout the region of what is now New Mexico and eastern Arizona. That's the southern part of the area in green on the map. 
I've put a blue oblong in the general vicinity of a coma and given you a view of modern a coma so that you can see the way it is built on a mesa or high ground. When settled, the Pueblos practiced horticulture, supplemented by hunting and warfare. The Acoma creation myth likened human life to plant life. Seeds planted in the earth and nourished by the rain sent up sprouts, comparable to the Pueblo people emerging into the world or an individual child being born. The sprouts eventually matured and produced their own seeds in a repeating cycle. Extended Pueblo families lived in matrilineal households, meaning that lines of family relationships were traced through women rather than patrilineal systems of Europe, particularly England. A family usually included a grandmother and her husband, her sisters, her daughters and their husbands, and an assortment of children. Women built the houses, and the houses belonged to them. The household, as well as activities symbolically related to it, were the province of women. If a household outgrew its space as daughters married, then more rooms were built onto the house, either horizontally or vertically. This is a modern example, but it gives you the basic idea. Women stayed in the home of their mother and inherited the dwelling when she died. Any activity relating to the village as a whole, to its deities, was under the control of men. Through regulating natural deities, as well as through warfare and trade, men saw to the safety of the entire town. One of the most important categories of hierarchy between men was age. Older men ranked over younger. Boys moved out of their birth house in adolescence to learn male magical lore in an all-male space as well as male activities like warfare before they could marry the first time. Marriage marked the transition in status from junior to senior for everyone. Juniors could choose their own partners but had to get approval from families. An exchange of gifts between lineages signaled agreement on everyone's part. I am giving you another picture to look at here. This is Taos Pueblo, and obviously the photo was taken much later in time than we are talking about in this lecture because there was no photography. In this case, the photo was taken in 1880. It does give some idea of how homes could be arranged relative to one another with a central town space. Returning to Pueblo's social structure at contact, marriage was not conceptualized as a lifelong tie, and most people practiced serial monogamy, meaning they formed a bond with one partner at a time, but they could, and at least some did, change partners through their life. Husbands moved into the household of their wives. If partners split, the man would move out, going either to a new wife's home or spending time in designated all-male spaces. Men might move from house to house, but they always had a bond to their mother's house. Women consolidated family ties by feeding everyone in the household, especially for the next bit here. Remember that for us now, no matter how much we might wish it, discussions of sexual intercourse are always loaded with layers of socially and historically added meaning and value, even if we don't realize it. Remember also the difficulties inherent in trying to reconstruct a system whose only written records lie with conquerors who viewed the world quite differently. With that said, it appears that among the Pueblo people at contact, women did not lose status through their sexuality. And indeed, women's sexuality was viewed positively. Women bore children who would offer their mothers labor and respect in old age. Women incorporated husbands into their maternal households through sex, and the men owed a duty of labor and respect in return. There is a theory that women's sex domesticated the dangerous spirits of nature and transformed them into peaceful household deities. 
activities. In this model, warfare was a male activity, peacemaking a woman's. Reconstructing ideas about sex in this situation is subject to many limitations, but it does appear that neither sexual intercourse nor naked bodies were considered inherently shameful, secret, or hidden, and sexual encounters between same-sex individuals seem not to have been viewed negatively. In addition to war, Farming, collecting wood, trading, and locating water were male activities. Men might work for their mother's household or for their sisters or for the household of their wife when they were married. Some men developed high skill in knowledge as a hunter, warrior, rain conjurer, or medicine man, and these were considered successful. These men accumulated wealth and might have more than one wife although wives do not appear to have had multiple husbands at one time. Older, successful men became leaders by accumulating followers. This was something developed over the course of a life, and it was not heritable. Again, the following reconstruction comes with all of the caveats that we've covered. Women's sexual and generative powers could drain men. So before hunts and really big rituals, men would abstain from sex with women. However, it is possible and appears to be the case that in adolescence, a few individuals with a penis that we would identify as male now would take on women's dress and embody a gender with its own definition, but that also included aspects of male and female. These individuals could not have intercourse with women, but some scholars suggest that they could have sex with men, even during times when men were abstaining from sex with women. This on the slide is a photo, so it is clearly from much later in time than our class, once again, the 1880s, but it represents a Zuni who occupied a similar role in terms of uniting male and female in one person. It was these individuals that the Spanish labeled putos, or male whores, and berdash, from the Arabic word berdash, meaning male prostitute. That is a terribly incomplete history of the pueblos at the time of European arrival. But you may have already noted that much of the Spanish worldview would seem to be in conflict with Pueblo society and values. The first Spanish arrived in the Pueblo region in 1539. Spain established Spanish New Mexico, starting with Santa Fe in 1610. The environment was dry and hostile. It was far from Mexico City, and it was distinctly lacking in gold and silver, things that were high on the list for the Spanish in general. Because of this, New Mexico never attracted many Spanish settlers. Those that did come survived in part by trading with and exploiting the surviving Pueblo people. So the region around the Pueblos had very little in the way of Spanish families for quite a while. The region did, however, attract ever hopeful Spanish explorers and military officers, as well as the ordinary soldiers who served the military officers and through them, Spain. Some of the Spanish explorers and military officers made it to what we would now call middle age. The soldiers were pretty much all young, the soldiers in North America and South America for that matter. They died or left the military in other ways, returning to Spain or settling in Spanish colonies. And regardless of whether they died or left the army alive, this generally happened before they reached their late 20s. All of these particular Spaniards were men. The context here was not Spanish culture generally in the 1500s. It was a very specific subset of people grouped together and creating a culture of their own. This does not, however, mean that events in Spain were irrelevant. It's difficult to find images that don't glorify Spanish colonizers 
I decided to focus on clothing. And in this image, you can see a foot soldier here, although not of all of him with a weapon. There is one type of religious uniform, and there are some nobles gesturing grandly or looking appropriately thoughtful. The man's ensemble on the right is held by LACMA in Southern California in LA. The fabric was made in the late 1500s, but the ensemble has been modified a bit at different times. The reality of fabric was that it had to be spun, designed, and woven all entirely by hand. There were, of course, looms, but these were set up and used by individuals. Extremely labor-intensive fabrics, like velvet on the right there, were not something that you just threw away when your outfit got a little out of date. So it is extremely rare to find an intact ensemble like this. And you can see that the fabric of the doublet is quite worn in places. But returning to Spain, leading up to the beginning of colonization of the Americas. We are jumping over the Atlantic to Europe, specifically to the Iberian Peninsula, and we're going back in time from where we left off the Puebla. Remember that I said the political organization of a nation or nation state was not an inevitable thing and only began in Europe around the time that Columbus was looking for funding for his expedition to what he hoped would be Asia. Some people have told me, less and less so now than in previous decades, thank goodness, that Columbus figured out that the world was round. People already knew that the world was round by that point. In fact, scholars in what we now identify as North Africa and the Middle East, as well as some European scholars, had not only figured out that the world was round, but had arrived at a fairly accurate calculation of its circumference. Columbus did not run into the Americas because he figured out that the world was round, but because he was a spectacularly bad mathematician. Columbus calculated a circumference for the Earth that was much smaller than the distance calculated by scholars. One of the reasons that no one had sailed far enough westward from Europe to hit the Americas is that most scholars, sailors, and merchants had calculated not only the circumference of the globe, but the amount of time it would take to get from Europe to the East Indies sailing westward, even with the best ships and technology that they had. These merchants and sailors realized that if there was no land in the Atlantic between Europe and Asia, and they had no particular reason at that point to assume that there was, they knew that their ships could not carry enough food and water to get even the hardiest of sailors to Asia by that route before they died. In fact, sailors, merchants, and the precursors of venture capitalists in the Renaissance knew that captain and crew would die at about the halfway point. It was not even a close thing. Columbus asked the wealthy rulers of city-states and the monarchs of kingdoms to fund his venture, and he was repeatedly refused. It was only when he got to Spain that he got funding, and it was not because the Spanish monarchy alone had been kept in the dark about the problems with trying to find a westward route across the Atlantic to Asia. So why would Spain fund someone that everyone else in Europe judged to be a crackpot? We are looking at the Iberian Peninsula in the year 790. There is no Spain at all. There is no Portugal. Up here in the yellow, there are areas ruled by monarchies, variously called principalities or kingdoms, but never queendoms, depending on how the ruler estimated their rank. The green is part of an empire that was centered in North Africa, south of the map here. And that empire included people who were predominantly Islamic. 
these kingdoms, including ones formed after our last map, more or less continuously adjusted their borders through a combination of fighting and diplomacy. Here in the year 900 on this new slide, you can see Castile in the top middle and Aragon to the east. By 1150, these kingdoms in the north of the slide here were still negotiating their borders with one another. They were also expanding southward and eating away at the northern border of what they considered the Moorish Empire, shown in green here. I am not going to go into crusades and so on, but these people who claimed the land north of the heavy line were mainly Christian. The people in power here were exclusively Christian, and it made sense to them to justify grabbing the territory to the south in the name of religion. At this point on the map, you can see that Portugal is beginning to form. Castile is still in the middle, although it's larger than it was before. And Aragon's name on the map here extends east into Catalonia because this border was in a state of flux even greater than most of the borders show. By 1300, we have Portugal on the west of the Iberian Peninsula with borders that are much like those of the present. Aragon has advanced southward, but is losing the border fight to Catalonia at this point. Point. It's difficult to see here with the colors they have chosen, but Catalonia extends south to contact Castile. Castile itself has swallowed up a huge triangular region through the center of the peninsula and has encircled the last bit of the Moorish Empire on the peninsula. We have changed art style and colors in a map, but here we have the Iberian Peninsula in 1453. Portugal in that purplish color is more or less set. Aragon has swallowed up Catalonia and Castile has all of the middle except this area in pale green. Granada, the last remnant on the Iberian Peninsula of an empire that Castile and Aragon and other Europeans, to be honest, considered a stronghold of infidels. The southward expansion of these kingdoms had long ago become a holy war in the minds of the Europeans to expel all infidels, in this case meaning not Christian broadly, from the Iberian Peninsula. It's 1453 here, and our first map was 790. This war that the Christians called the Reconquista, I won't go into the name here yet, this war for territory justified by religion was exceedingly bloody and violent, even by the standards of European warfare at the time. And the fighting had been going on pretty much continuously for 700 years. That's more than a few generations of soldiers, violence, avid Christians, and a cause that could unify these other kingdoms in a single purpose against someone identified as an outsider. In 1469, Queen Isabella I of Castile married King Ferdinand II of Aragon, unifying the two kingdoms into Spain. Spain and France would quibble about this border, especially over Navarre here, and Catalonia, as well as Navarre, periodically seek independence right up to now. But the borders of these countries, of Portugal, Spain, and France, were more or less set in 1469. Except this tiny region of Granada down here. It was smaller than it had been, but it still existed. And it still existed as a mainly Islamic region. In 1478, Isabella and Ferdinand set up the Tribunal of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, 
what is now generally called the Spanish Inquisition, with the aim of rooting out heresy from Spain. Most Americans know the Inquisition for its brutality and for the mass expulsions of Jews and Muslims from Spain. Then in 1492, Spain took over Granada and celebrated the successful, for them, conclusion of the Reconquista. 1492 marked the end of the Reconquista, but not smooth sailing for Spain from that point forward. The kingdoms and empires to the east had a fairly direct line to the riches of Asia, either by land or through the Mediterranean. That left these countries along the western Atlantic border having to sail south around Africa to access trade with Asia or pay a number of stages of middlemen as goods worked their way through the rest of the Europe to the Mediterranean. Portugal was small, but the ships that they designed had already allowed them to navigate down the west coast of Africa, giving them fairly direct access to the riches of Africa, as well as around the southern tip of Africa and on to trade with Asia. England had ambitions, but at this point it was still sorting out internal conflict to become a nation, think Wars of the Roses, so it wasn't really exploring much yet. That left France, which had already become a fairly powerful consolidated nation, and Spain, which shared a border with France, a contested border with France. Maintaining national boundaries takes money, and just at the point when Spain had really extended as far south as it could, the same year as the end of the Reconquista, along came Columbus, with his sort of harebrained scheme of sailing west across the Atlantic to Asia without starving on the way. Isabella and Ferdinand had enough to gain relative to the loss of a few ships and 90 or so men that it was worth it to take the gamble of backing Columbus. If Columbus failed, as seemed likely, well, three ships and 90 men was an acceptable loss. If Columbus succeeded, and remember success meant reaching Asia at that point, not hitting land that Europeans had no idea was there, if Columbus succeeded in reaching Asia, Spain would have access to wealth that would allow it to maintain itself as a nation within the larger political machinations of Europe. We know that Columbus hit the Americas and Spain was desperate for money, filled with religious fervor and in possession of trained soldiers who were spinning their wheels a bit after the successful for Spain conclusion of the Reconquista. Isabella and Ferdinand had won their gamble on Columbus, albeit not quite in the way any of them had planned. So now we will head back to the southwest corner of North America as Spain sought to extend its holdings and control. Initially, Spain focused on exploration and military conquest, particularly of the Aztec and Inca empires. And Spain, as you may know, hit on regions that were rich in gold and silver in those areas. We are going to zoom in on this region, officially the Viceroyalty of New Spain. We are looking at this region with Taos Pueblo and Santa Fe. We know that Spain claimed this region, but also that they did not really control it. And you can see on the map that the region we are looking at is comparatively far from the capital of New Spain here in Mexico City. After the initial round of military expeditions to North America, the Spanish shifted strategies. Catholic missions became central to Spanish colonization, and missionaries, many of them Franciscans, advanced Spain's interests in North America. You are looking at the current version of San Miguel Mission in Santa Fe. The original version was built in 1610, as soon as Santa Fe was established. It has been rebuilt at least twice since then. One of the early reconstructions was done following the 16 
1880 Pueblo Revolt that we will be getting to in this lecture. Franciscan missionaries began colonization of Spanish New Mexico in 1581. The Franciscans who entered Spanish New Mexico were veterans of missionizing through the Spanish Empire in the Americas. Members of this particular group were extreme believers or zealots, if you prefer who had in mind not just converting entire villages of Native Americans, but turning them into theocracies, meaning societies ruled by religious figures in which Native Americans would, and this is a quote, spend their time marching in processions and praising God with hymns. To this end, Franciscans sought to resettle indigenous Pueblo people into European-style peasant communities. The Franciscans oversaw the building of forts and missions while they tried to convert the Pueblo people to Catholicism, forcibly, if need be. These Franciscan missionaries required the Pueblo people to provide labor and to reform their society, including marriage and family structure, around Spanish Catholic lines. If you are thinking that this does not sound much like peaceful conversion and that the Franciscan missionaries would have needed military backing if they were to compel the Pueblo people to comply, you would be correct. In 1598, a man named Juan de Oñate, accompanied by 400 soldiers, settlers, and missionaries, traveled from Mexico proper into New Mexico. The picture here is just a generalized band of Spaniards arriving in the region. I didn't have any particular desire to highlight Oñate. The Native American residents of the smaller pueblos fled. But those of the larger, more powerful pueblos greeted the Spanish with gifts and, significantly for our lecture here, possibly with consensual sex. Which brings us to the point that sex as an activity, although it may be linked to reproduction in humans, certainly is not even meant to serve that purpose in every case of intercourse. Moreover, the same act can be interpreted in radically different ways, depending on what it means within a specific social context. For the Pueblos, gift giving was part of conflict resolution and negotiation. And remember that it is possible that one of the powers of women's sex was to calm dangers and create peace. This is, however, not how the Spanish soldiers saw it. The soldiers considered sex a form of domination for men over not only women, but the entire group the women belonged to. Spanish soldiers interpreted any apparent acceptance of sex as a tribute to their prowess. But the soldiers in New Mexico expressed confusion that the Pueblo husbands did not seem to care that their wives had sex with others. Remember that the soldiers would judge not caring by their own parameters. The Spanish soldiers commented that husbands neither punished nor abandoned their wives. The Spanish priests were horrified at what they interpreted as the bestial wicked sin by which they made sodomy among the Pueblos. The priests were also troubled by the actions of Spanish soldiers, but many of these missionaries had been with Spanish soldiers when they captured Moorish towns on the Iberian Peninsula and knew that these soldiers considered permission to rape conquered people a part of their recompense for the risks inherent in their own job. In this light, the priests were nearly as horrified by the Spanish soldiers as by the Pueblos, but in the case of soldiers, the priests settled for grumbling that Oñate gave too much freedom, making the conversion of Pueblos to European religion and morality more difficult. A combination of Spanish entitlement and miscommunications led to disaster. Part of the occupying Spanish force 
traveling from one town to another, stopped at a Coma Pueblo for provisions. Note that I am just saying stopped for provisions, not stopped to ask for provisions. The soldiers and officers who expected what they thought was regular tribute felt that the people of Acoma were stingy compared to previous visits, which made perfect sense to the Pueblo people as the Spanish had yet to reciprocate for the gifts previously given to them. When some of the Spanish soldiers went up the Mesa to Acoma to try to get the tribute that they thought they were due, one of the soldiers stole turkeys and forced a junior woman who had never been married into non-consensual sex. Acoma warriors attacked the Spanish soldiers, killing 12 of them and one officer. The surviving Spaniards fled back to Oñate. Oñate sent a force led by the brother of the officer who had been killed. Half of the around 1,500 inhabitants of Acoma were killed outright, regardless of sex or age. Oñate had surviving Pueblo men mutilated and enslaved surviving women and children. The enormity of this violence had the desired effect of making the Pueblo people as a whole more pliable, including to missionaries. The missionaries, for their part, reported to the Viceroy in Mexico City that Oñate hindered conversions through his violence and, moreover, that he, again quoting, lived dishonorably and scandalously with women, married and unmarried, and that he allowed his soldiers similar license. Oñate was recalled and replaced by a governor and 50-5-0 married soldiers with their families. It was this group that founded Santa Fe in 1610, although many of the families would return to more congenial or at least less deadly locations not long after. The Franciscans were now free to pursue their vision of theocracy and people it with Native Americans. The missionaries capitalized on the fear of violence from the soldiers in Santa Fe, but also appropriated Pueblo sacred spaces and functions, like calling for rain. I have been stressing that the missionaries who went to Spanish New Mexico at the end of the 16th century were Franciscans, and a specific group of Franciscans with a very precise conception of the relationship of the body to the spirit and to the divine, to chastity and to eroticism. This matters because it affected the way that this particular group of missionaries interacted with this particular group of Native Americans at this particular point in time. The group of Spanish missionaries that went to New Mexico at the end of the 16th century adhered to the strictest interpretation of Franciscanism involving severe discipline, mystical retreat, and abject poverty. These men rejected the male cult of sexual aggressiveness associated with warfare. Their disgust with Oñate and his soldiers was almost certainly genuine. Note that disgust with Oñate and his soldiers is not at all the same thing as sympathetic to the Pueblo people. The training that these Franciscans underwent involved three stages, which we know a fair amount about because they are described in their novitiate guides and manuals. These were purgation, or getting rid of the old self, illumination through the emulation of the lives of Christ and St. Francis, and a mystical marriage between Christ, the bridegroom, and the individual soul, the bride. The first goal was achieved through the taming and punishment of the flesh with devout and continuous prayer, flagellations, meaning flogging or whipping, vigils, fasting, and rejecting enjoyment from food or drink. All physical and social desires were to be not just suppressed, but excised 
completely. Among these desires, lust was the greatest sin and considered a metaphor for all impurity and worldliness. You might recall that Pueblo men appear to have abstained from sex before hunts and rituals. This would only be done for a matter of days, but the idea of ritual chastity at least made sense to them, even if a lifetime so spent seemed extreme. Illumination for the Franciscans came through trying to live as Christ and St. Francis had done. Included in this was observing God's presence in nature. This, once again, was something that could resonate with the Pueblo people. Returning to the Franciscans, once illumination had been achieved, the soul as Christ's bride approached mystical marriage with her bridegroom Christ through suffering. Martyrdom, either figurative or literal death, was always the ultimate goal for the individuals in this group. This is why this particular group volunteered to set up the missions in New Mexico when other groups would not. For these Franciscans, there was a twofold attraction. First, bringing souls to Christ but also in having their own souls reach the summit of perfection through martyrdom, uniting with God in spiritual marriage. The Franciscan novitiate manuals for this group drew from two mystical traditions that developed in European religious thought by the Renaissance. In the first, the union with God was described through the metaphor of sexual intercourse. According to the novitiate manuals, the soul bride would cry out to the bridegroom Christ, and these are quotes, inflame me and embrace me totally with the fire of your love so that my entire soul melts on you, flows on you, and is united perfectly with you. Kiss me. The soul would desire that Christ, and again quoting, penetrate her intimately, and she would cry out, Oh my love, ah, love of my life. The second mystical tradition also drew on erotic and marital metaphors, but blended these with the pains of crucifixion. The picture you are looking at was painted by the Spanish artist Francisco de Ribalta in 1628, depicting Christ embracing St. Bernard. It conveys something of the combination of pain, ecstasy, sorrow, and love conceived of in the Franciscan metaphor. And here we get to a place of tension between Franciscan and Pueblo beliefs. Although both spiritual systems drew on the metaphor of sexual intercourse, for the Franciscans, it should only ever be metaphor. The soul's union was erotic but chaste, and lest a novice awake in the night with an erection because he had dreamed of Christ's kisses and intimate embrace, the novitiate training manuals actually outlined the prescribed method of dealing with this, meaning presumably that this at least occurred frequently enough that a standard form of punishment was assigned. The novice was to give himself 15 lashes while contemplating the wound in Christ's side. The Franciscans in 17th century New Mexico believed that if the Pueblo people were to reach God, they would have to go through an analogous three stages, purgation, illumination, and union. The purgation assigned to the Pueblo peoples began with the systematic repudiation of Pueblo spiritual practices. In order to facilitate this, the friars raided both sacred spaces and homes, removed anything that seemed idolatrous to them, and destroyed it. After this, the friars sought to curb the sins of the flesh. Recall that in Pueblo society, sex was positively valued. It assured both social and cosmic reproduction, and the Pueblo people did not associate either the activity or their naked bodies with shame. None of this, nor the apparent acceptance of same-sex intercourse, went over well with the Franciscans. 
they justified a regime of extreme sexual repression as the only route to God. The Franciscos in New Mexico required the Pueblo people to practice chastity before marriage, fidelity in marriage, sexual intercourse only within a properly sanctioned marriage, and only in the missionary position, in case you have ever wondered why it was called that. Lifelong indissoluble monogamy and modesty and shame in all bodily matters. Pueblo people who violated these extensive laws of sexual morality were to be publicly whipped, placed in stocks, and shorn of their hair. In order to achieve the second phase, illumination, the Franciscans decided that the Pueblo people should be moved close together to make instruction on religion, politics, and economics easier. The Franciscan missionaries reduced 150 or so villages to 43. The friars encouraged junior members of Pueblo society to reject senior members and children to repudiate their parents. The Franciscans likened this to their own transformation when they rejected their earthly fathers in favor of their heavenly father. Through baptism, the friars would become spiritual fathers to the Native Americans. The Franciscans were particularly interested in baptizing and taking control of young people before they experienced the sins of the flesh. Missionaries punished Pueblo fathers who resisted this taking of their children and retraining them by grabbing the father's genitals and twisting them until the man collapsed or by sodomizing him. The missionaries also required changes in the sexual division of labor to bring the Pueblo people into alignment with European norms. At contact among the Pueblos, men spun, wove, hunted, and protected the community. Women built homes and cared for the home and the people in it. The Spanish required men to do construction and women to weave fabric. Hunting, warfare, and any non-Christian religious practices were simply forbidden. In the place of meat obtained from hunting, the missionaries distributed livestock to young men who promised to be monogamous and to only marry once. The Franciscans took over the right to approve or reject marriages from familial lineages. Pueblo women lost their exclusive rights to land, seeds, and children. Among those groups most exposed to Spanish missionaries, matrilineal lines were disrupted and replaced by the patrilineal systems of Europe. New Mexico was never heavily settled by the Spanish, but through the 17th century, the numbers of soldiers and settlers willing to stay gradually increased. You are looking at a map of the province of New Mexico made later in time, 1758. Over the course of the 17th century, so the 1600s, periods of disease, including smallpox, took a toll on both Native Americans and colonists. Governors and settlers enslaved Native Americans and demanded a heavy tribute of labor, and the neighboring Apache became expert raiders with horses, introduced by the Spanish, preying upon people in the region, including the Pueblo. The Pueblo people saw the power of the Franciscans against soldiers and governors decline, and the friars had absolutely no control over the ravages of disease or the raid of the Apache. Over the decades, friction between Spanish political and religious leaders increased, and each tried to win control over the Pueblo people from the other. The original Franciscans were gradually supplemented by another cohort of friars, and these did not always keep 
their vows of chastity as assiduously. By 1660, one friar reported that all the villages included children of friars begotten with Pueblo women. Governors received the complaints from Pueblo people and denounced the friars and the Franciscans sent two governors to the Inquisition in Mexico City. Christianized Pueblo denounced those who practice pre-contact rituals and those who resisted Christianity became particularly abusive to the mestizo children of the friars. We have here multiple groups both in and out fighting. As the situation deteriorated, more Pueblo people returned to their own spiritual practices, and the Franciscans turned in on themselves, seeking a renewed connection to their own desire for union with God and martyrdom. Missionaries resorted to increasingly violent punishments when they discovered Pueblo people following their own spiritual and sexual practices. Some friars deliberately used exceedingly violent punishments to push the Pueblo people to the breaking point in a quest for their own martyrdom. Soldiers responded to the martyrdom of a Spanish friar by visiting even greater violence on the Pueblo people. Part of the Pueblo population rebelled in 1680 under the leadership of a charismatic and tactically brilliant medicine man, Pope, who had personally suffered at the hands of the Spanish. Under Pope, Pueblo warriors joined by Apaches effectively isolated and attacked Spanish settlements. They then laid siege to Santa Fe. You are looking at part of a mural painted by two Hopi artists in 2001, depicting the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. In the end, a small percentage of Spanish escaped to El Paso. As they retreated, they found that Spanish settlements had been destroyed and that a particular violence had been visited on friars and Catholic sacred objects. The surviving Spaniards seemed perplexed by this, apparently not making the connection between what they saw and the friars' destruction of Pueblo sacred spaces and objects and the violence brought to bear on Pueblo people who retained their own spiritual practices. Having ousted the Spanish, the Pueblo people vowed to return to their own names and practices, including family and marriage formation. Members of the Franciscan order in Mexico City now included the few survivors from New Mexico, decided that, this is quote, the only thing they were guilty of was selfless love for the Indians. And these friars celebrated the martyrdom of their brothers. The Spanish military tried to retake New Mexico fairly quickly, but the Pueblo people were able to hold out for a decade until famine and disease, accompanying a severe nine-year drought and complicated by internal divisions, led them to make peace with the Spanish. Key points of Lecture 6 Reconstructions of Pueblo life before Spanish conquest, particularly marriage and sexual practices, is complicated by the fact that the only written records we have were created by Spanish sources who had very little understanding of what they encountered. These sources were also motivated to justify the conquest of the Pueblo people by presenting them as sinful and or inferior to the Spanish. Nevertheless, it does seem, at the very least, that the Pueblo people at the time of contact did not associate either the sexual act or nudity with shame. They appear also to have accepted at least some same-sex sexual practices. The Spaniards who eventually entered the Pueblo region included soldiers, settlers, and Franciscan missionaries, all of whom wanted the loyalty and labor of the Pueblo people. All of these Spaniards used violence to get what they wanted, although their justifications for interfering with Pueblo life reflected somewhat differing worldviews. 
the Franciscans, who acted as missionaries to the Pueblo people in Spanish New Mexico, had a very particular conception of their own relationship with God and became full members of their order through a three-part process of purgation, or getting rid of the old self, illumination through the emulation of the lives of Christ and St. Francis, and a mystical marriage between Christ, the bridegroom, and the individual soul, the bride. These missionaries then tried to enact a similar three-part program to convert the Pueblo people to Catholicism and the acceptance of early modern Spanish social and sexual norms. This included efforts to destroy all parts of Pueblo spiritual practice. The friars also sought to take minute control of the sex, intercourse, family structure, and marriages of the Pueblo people. The Pueblo Revolt of 1680 shows up in most basic American history classes. Our interest in it here is to observe the completely different constructions of sex gender between the Spanish soldiers and missionaries and the Pueblos. This included, for the Pueblos, the recognition of a sex gender beyond female and male. The extreme nature of Spanish efforts to control the sexual lives of conquered Native Americans. The degree to which such control negatively affected Native Americans and the depth of Native American resistance. This is one of those lectures that is extremely difficult to leave on a light note. What I can do is give you something beautiful. These are pots made in the Acoma Pueblo in the 21st century. It is so much easier to destroy than it is to create. It doesn't make up for past destruction, but the reality that people are able to connect with what is beautiful to them in their historical context and to create in the wake of destruction helps me get through some of these lectures.